Hi, my name is Clay. I'm a student physical therapist at South College. Um, today I'm going to be starting uh, talking about functional sympatholysis. So uh, it all starts with activation of the skeletal muscle fibers. So we got the skeletal muscle fibers, they contract, and we're going to release metabolites. And these metabolites are going to come down and they're going to activate the um, endothelial cells and the uh, smooth muscle cells. And when these endothelial cells are activated, we're going to get release of uh, potassium and or from these potassium channels that are opened. When that happens, we're gonna get hyperpolarization, so we're gonna get a more negative charge in the endothelial cells, and that's gonna pass through to adjacent endothelial cells and into the smooth muscle cells. When we get that hyperpolarization of the smooth muscle cells, we're gonna get inhibition of these calcium channels, which is going to affect the contractility, because we get that calcium-induced calcium release if we don't have calcium there, we're not going to get that calcium release, and we're going to get vasodilation of those smooth muscle do those smooth muscle cells of the uh, blood vessels. Um, at the same time, when we're exercising, we're uh, activating the sympath sympathetic nervous system. So we got this sympathetic nerve right here, the fiber. What that's going to do is it's going to release norepinephrine, and we're going to have a uh, receptor that's going to activate the calcium channels and the sarcoplasmic reticulum to increase the calcium concentration within the smooth muscle cell. When we get that increased calcium concentration, we're gonna get that calcium induced calcium release and we're going to get increased contractility, so we're gonna get vasoconstriction. However, when we're exercising, we don't want that vasoconstriction. We don't want to reduce blood flow. So what happens is when this muscle contracts, it's releasing metabolites over here to the endothelial cells and the smooth muscle cells, but we're also gonna get metabolites that are gonna come over here and they're gonna inhibit the sympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nerve fiber from releasing that norepinephrine. It's going to block this process from happening and we're not going to get that vasoconstriction. So we're going to get, we're going to get increased blood flow which is going to be more helpful to us if we're trying to exercise or um, run from a bear, for example. I chose this subject because I found functional sympatholysis to be very interesting, but I found it even more interesting how it affects or how it's impaired in hypertensive individuals. Uh, I was diagnosed with hypertension a few years ago, and when I originally got diagnosed, when I'd work out, I'd feel a bounding pulse, I'd get fatigued a lot easier, and I'd sometimes I'd get dizzy. And going over this in class kind of made this super interesting to me because it, it showed, it kind of gave me reasons as to why. Um, so looking right here, we're looking at how functional sympathylysis is impaired in hypertensive individuals, and we're looking uh, at, at their blood flow. So we add negative pressure here at the beginning, and we see both normotensive and hypertensive patients have a drop in blood flow, which is, is normal because that uh, sympathetic nervous system um, activation. Then we add some hand grip exercises, and we, we try it again. And so this time, uh, when we add the negative pressure, the normal tensive pa uh, patients, they don't have a drop because that functional sympatholysis is working properly. Um, whereas hypertensive patients, we have a bigger drop in blood flow because we're not getting that sympatholysis, that functional sympatholysis. And then down here a little further, we see that um, these normal patients are maintaining their O2 levels where hypertensive patients are not maintaining those levels. Um, that metabolic autoregulation isn't working properly. Um, and this isn't necessarily related to the functional sympathylysis, but this also has to do with, again, um, hypertensive uh, regulation in um, patients. And that also kind of intrigued me. Um, so on this right side, in general, we have damaged endothelium, and on this left side, we have uh, intact endothelium. And we're looking at acetylcholine. Uh, so we have a, a set tension right here, and as we add more acetylcholine on, in these uh, healthy individuals, the, uh, the tension drops, we get vasodilation, whereas on this right side, we're not getting any drop in tension. Um, the endothelium isn't reacting properly because it's damaged. So this just shows that the damaged endothelium can have a role in um, vasodilation and constriction. And we're gonna apply it down here. Um, we have acetylcholine, which is a endothelial dependent uh, vasodilator. And we see in normal patients when added, we get an uh, increase in blood flow, whereas hypertensive patients, we don't get that much of an increase. We see the resistance change. There's a greater change in resistance with um, normal patients than hypertensive. Um, so that just shows us correlation, but we look over here at sodium nitroperoxide, which is an uh, endothelial independent 
independent vasodilator. And we see there's not a big change in either flow or resistance with hypotensive and normal um, patients. There's not a big difference between them. So this just shows that uh, hypertension patients like I, like me, have uh, some sort of endothelial dysfunction. And that just shows that all these symptoms I've been feeling are normal.